Chapter 4 All is Well Fletch sat back on his heels and stared at the stone. Though less weathered than the circles which had been at the mercy of wind and rain, this design was almost certainly as old. Had the maze across the lake been there that long? Could the design on the stone be a copy of it? In his preoccupation with the labyrinth, he had almost forgotten the other two stones. Heaving them over with the iron rail, he found the two remaining designs, one of a hand with the fingers spread wide, the other a tree with spreading branches. Nothing about the wet rest of the weed garden was unusual. The rocks along the edge were common field stones. Fletch could hardly wait for his father to return from Atlanta. Surely he would know something about the maze and the designs on the stones. The air carried the smell of sunshine and tall grass from the cemetery and the woods and fields beyond. Fletch walked down to the barn to get the mower, knowing his father would expect some progress by the time he returned. The old snapper, still in good condition, started on the first pull. The grass was so tall he had to set the blade high and run the mower in a low gear but it left a broad, satisfying path as he drove it toward the house. He had cut the grass here before, but each time the yard seemed to get bigger. There were places where he couldn't quite tell whether he was still in the yard or not, because the grass extended into the trees by the lake. At one place near the weed garden, the remnant of an old roadway was visible. There the grass gave way to pine needles, but the deep forest didn't begin until the road passed beyond the boundaries of the property. From there, Dad had once pointed out, you could hike five miles without ever meeting a modern road. The forked ways are out there, Fletch thought with a stir of excitement, somewhere down that trail. Just beyond a stand of pines near the barn stood an orchard of drooping apple trees. His grandparents had sometimes talked of cleaning it up a little and having the trees looked after, but over the years it had remained neglected. Because of the forest and the high wall of the barn, it was mostly hidden from the rest of the yard. The air was close there, heavy with the scent of fallen apples. It could be a dangerous place, as Fletch had learned when he was younger. Windfalls, which looked fresh on the ground, could conceal dripping wounds, festering with yellow jackets. At the farthest end of the orchard was an old well built of mossy stones. Once, long ago, he had gone down to the well and lifted up the rotten boards which covered the opening. Deep down, impossibly far from light, he had seen a glint of water like a small coin at the bottom of a barrel full of night. He never went back to the well after that. He avoided the orchard altogether. The dead gray face which stared up at him from the distant water hadn't been his own. On his break for lunch, Fletch found the house surprisingly cool. He made a sandwich, poured a glass of iced tea, and started to go back outside. Then he noticed that while the door to the back stairs was closed as usual, the door to the basement was standing open. Feeling slightly foolish at his uneasiness, he went over and closed it firmly. Then, on impulse, he opened it again and looked down the steps. Nothing. Just to be sure, he grasped the cord and tugged it, but the light at the bottom of the steps failed to snap on. It felt as if the cord had gotten off the track and was hanging on to something, or maybe something was hanging on to the cord. Fletch swallowed and moved to shut the door again, but it refused to budge. Almost frantically, he shoved against it, but it remained standing open, relentless and impassive. Deep cold rose from the darkness at the bottom of the steps, and in his mind he heard an inarticulate rush of sound like a broken curse flung from the window of a speeding car. 
Who's down there? Flet shouted. He turned and fled. From the driveway, he stared up at the frowning back porch and the rusty screen door. Through the windows of the kitchen, he could dimly see the upper part of the oven, the paper towel rack, and the row of blue willow dishes along the wall cupboard. He felt safer, but not safe enough to return to the kitchen and retrieve his abandoned lunch. Gathering his courage, he circled the house and entered through the front door. The parlor and dining room felt okay, but he stopped at the door which led back to the kitchen and butlery. I thought we were getting to be friends, old house. What's wrong with you? The grandfather clock in the front hall chimed the quarter hour, but apart from that, the house made no response. His father's car pulled into the drive a half hour later. Grass looks great, he said, beaming. Smells just like I remember. Fletch followed him into the house. The basement door was closed. I found something strange this morning, he said. You know those big stones in the weed garden? They've got carvings on them. The corner stones? Mark looked thoughtful. I think there's only one of them like that. It has circles on it, like the ones on the altar at the church. We used to fill the circles with seed and watch the birds fly down to get it. The other designs are on the bottom of the stones. I turned them over to check, and there they were. Come look at them. Fletch's father followed him outside, and they walked the line of the zigzag fence, studying each of the stones carefully. Curious, he said. You know what the weed garden is, don't you, Fletch? Fletch thought for a minute. An, an old cemetery plot? Maybe with signs on the stones instead of names? His father shook his head. It's where the old church was, the brush arbor, and the one which followed it. I've always heard that these stones were part of the foundation. Maybe the symbols were already there, Indian signs or something, and they just used the stones because they were handy. Mark squatted on his heels and traced his finger through the pattern of the labyrinth. I'm no archaeologist, Fletch, but I don't think these are Indian carvings. They are too sharp probably made with metal tools. Besides, the circles are part of our own church history. The design comes from Calabria in southern Italy, dates back at least to the 12th century. I believe they're supposed to represent the Trinity. Do you know what the others mean? I found a strange sort of path in the woods across the lake which loops around just like this maze. His father looked at him, surprised. I had no idea you'd been over there. That place is peculiar. I can't recall if it had anything to do with the Indians, but I don't think there's anything else like it in the area. Betsy Weathers has some old church records which mention it, and I'm sure she knows more about these stones than I do. We'll have to ask her about them. Mark Forrester stood up and dusted off his hands. Though his manner remained light, Fletch could tell that something about the stones disturbed him. That afternoon, they made a trip to Fletcher's new school in Brazelton, where late registration was being offered to students who were transferring from other schools. It had two low brick wings, each with a single hall, joined at the front by a sheltered concrete breezeway. The gym and several two-room annexes were set apart from the main building. They had been told that the enrollment here was quite small, only 600 students in the first through twelfth grades. It seemed a gloomy place, with no carpet on the grey tiled floors and massive dents in many of the lockers. Sets of long fluorescent lights whirred and wavered with an irritating flicker. The pale blue illumination reminded Fletch of old neon, and it afforded a lingering impression of late-night bus stations or backstreet barber shops, more nearly a taste or scent than a visual recollection. Halfway down the empty hall, a janitor walked behind a roaring buffing machine, dragging its thick black cord behind him like a tail. At the main office, they were greeted by Renée Duran, a high school girl sitting at the secretary's desk. She told them how to find the counselor's office. "'You're tenth grade?' she asked. "'So am I. 
we'll have most of our classes together. The counselor was young and dark-haired, with a faintly Italian accent. She introduced herself as Miss Ahumara, led them into the tiny room which served as her office, and cleared off a small couch to sit on. A dusty air conditioner blocked the window, but it must have been broken. An electric fan clattered away on a high stool, sending a steady stream of air across the room. At one moment all seemed to be going well. Miss Ahumada was filling out his schedule based on a combination of required courses and Fletch's own preferred electives. Fletch was working through a sheet which recorded his name, address, and personal information. Then the world began to turn slowly upside down. He stared at the question on the page before him. Race. Caucasian, white. Black or African American, Hispanic. Eskimo or Native American. Asian or Pacific Islander. Other. Fletch's pencil hovered over Caucasian, white, then moved to other. In the blank next to the word he wrote, human. He was conscious of a low ringing hum, which seemed to originate in the back of his brain, but which was inexplicably connected with the flickering lights, the rattling fan, and the question on the page before him. Miss Ahumada asked him something, and abruptly a wave of dizziness swept over him, together with an intolerable sense of being trapped. His hands and feet had gone numb, and for a moment he thought he was going to black out. Fletch managed to answer the counselor politely, then casually asked her for directions to the restroom. Maintaining an outward show of composure, he went into the hall and found the proper door. Blindly he pushed it open, and barely made it into the toilet stall before throwing up. His body convulsed repeatedly. It's okay, he told himself. No big deal. It's just lunch going backwards. Finally the nausea passed. He went to the faucet, rinsed his mouth, and flooded his face and hands with cold water. Slowly the dark tide began to recede. His mirrored reflection was pallid and weary. His eyes stubbornly refused to focus. Why should a stupid form bother me so much, he wondered. There are plenty of people like me. No one would even suspect, really, except maybe for my hair. His parents had told him all his life that there was no such thing as race, that the whole concept was artificial, and that people came in more colors than anybody could count. Out of curiosity he had read a bit about how people had been classified in the past, and more than once he had come across the term mongrel. He knew he should go at once and tell his father what had happened. This rush of panic was too much like the episodes he'd experienced during his recovery from the automobile accident. After a few minutes, though, he felt better. He tried touching his toes and holding his breath, just to see if he could make the dizziness come back, but it seemed to have faded away. The way he had concealed his discomfort in the counselor's office had been so adept that his father hadn't realized anything was the matter. For the rest of the day, Fletch puzzled over the incident. The tide, as he had come to think of it, must be something psychological. It came from deep within, from a country without edges, which he could observe from a great distance but never approach, where the only sound was the somnolent humming of bleak power stations, the hungry rhythm of vast but stationary machines. Closing his eyes, he imagined open wells in an empty blasted courtyard, surrounded by walls of black bricks under a somber sky. The tide came out of those wells, traveling along heavy electrical cables that ran to points along his spine and the base of his skull. A charge must have built up in one of those monstrous coils, and it had overloaded, surging up through the cables to his brain. Maybe something had broken inside him during the accident, and now he was at the mercy of things like this, things beyond his control. He was at the point of trying to open up to his father about it during supper, when the telephone rang in the hall. 
Mark got up to answer it, and when he returned, Fletch could tell before he spoke that it would require a pastoral visit. Florence Avery, Mark explained. Josh had an accident this morning. Got caught in some kind of trap. Doc Merritt's fixing him up, but I'd better run by. Want me to come? No need. Finish your supper and enjoy the evening. I shouldn't be too late. Mark left at once, pausing only to change into a coat and tie. Fletch left the dishes to soak and decided he felt well enough to row across the lake and explore the labyrinth again. It was only a little after six o'clock, but he left a note in case his father returned before he got back. The boat was tied at an inlet where a gnarled willow dipped its crooked fingers into the lake. Fletch liked the way the tree was reflected in the dark water, the way clouds moved slowly through a submerged sky. Further along the shore, a marsh bird with a white mohawk and a long orange beak stepped carefully through the mud. Frequently it paused to strike at something in the shallow water, but Fletch never saw it come up with anything. In the tops of the pines, a whirring sound began softly, rose to a frantic, sustained peak, then tapered quickly off. After a few moments, the cycle began again. His shoulders were stiff from yesterday's rowing, but he knew they would loosen up with practice. The lake looked heavy and still, and the water turned in ropey undulations as his boat cut through it. Far ahead, the forest stretched out welcoming arms. The trees sighed as if they had missed him. When he reached the opposite bank, he set off in the direction he had gone before, hoping he'd be able to remember enough about the forest to locate the labyrinth. This time, he vowed, he would enter the clearing itself. And if the satyr were there? Fletch remembered the flash of the boy's hair, the gleam of the sun on his shoulders. Maybe they would become friends for life. Rather to his surprise, Fletch soon found the fallen oak he had crossed on his first trip. This time he climbed down into the ravine and sat for a while on the thick moss beside the stream, watching the water pour over the stones and swirl among the roots of a nearby beech tree. He bent to drink, careless that it splashed over his hair and swept coldly across his cheek. He felt giddy and wild. When he raised his head, the forest was transfigured. The sun, flashing through the canopy of trees, blinded him with shining bits of gold. All around him the forest sang, shadows moved, wind stirred. Fletch stood up, nerves tingling, water running down his arms, and raised his hands high, spreading his fingers as the mild wind slipped through them. His clothing felt binding, as senseless as a suit of armor. Taking hold of a slender dogwood, he pulled himself up and over the lip of the ravine. By the time he found the labyrinth, evening had begun to settle over the woods. Incessant voices surged through the summer air, compelling him toward the clearing and a confrontation with its woodland god. This time he was ready. He turned the last curve of the maze and saw the clearing filled with soft light. The wind ran its hand through the grass. But no one was there. The clearing was empty. Slowly the magical euphoria left him. The forest returned to the simple elements of wood and water, earth and stone. Fletch couldn't help feeling disappointed, even slightly betrayed, though he had no real reason to suppose that he might find the boy there. He didn't enter the clearing. Instead, he remained under the cover of the trees, watching as the light gave way to summer darkness. He felt suddenly weary and lost. All his gods were vanishing, going down irretrievably into the dark. Old memories and loves were no longer able to help him. They had been drained of power, and a terrible dread was replacing them. That night he lay on top of the sheet, staring up at the slatted ceiling, trying to let go of his worry and fall asleep. The bones of the old house creaked and snapped. As the night cooled, the timbers shrank and settled. Outside the open window he could hear bullfrogs at the edge of the lake, 
in a brooding corral with the house, the wind, and the groaning pines. All through the pleasant places of assembly something lurked just beyond perception, a creeping breath of mildew or a flutter of black wings. Turning over in bed, he reached across to the nightstand for the leaf of sage he had picked last night after the gospel singing. The little leaf felt dry and papery, but still bore a trace of scent. Finally he slept, clutching it in his hand like a talisman. Beyond the lake, a warm blanket of dark lay over the dreaming land. Moonlight filled the woods with stark contrasts of deep black and gleaming silver. As he dreamed, the forest enclosed him with its solemn, stately song. Its voice came from somewhere deep among roots and hidden springs. As Fletch entered the clearing, the music of the night soured and died, vanquished by a blasphemy complete and unthinkable. From the tall waves of blowing grass rose the dim shape of the orchard well. He was too stunned to think of flight. Instead, he moved toward it, reached out, and touched the words engraved on one of the stones. Originally intended as a reassuring play on words, to him they had a more direct meaning, reflecting the end result of his deepest fears. All is well. He took hold of the rotten covering and lifted it up. Just inside and below the rim was what he had known would be there. The dead face with black pebble eyes, the toothless mouth with its thick black tongue. It was only half human, a ruin of corruption, its bloodless fingers clinging to the rim of the well. Fletch came awake with a shout, standing beside his bed, tangled in the sheet, his hands before him, fingers arched into claws. The night voices were silent, not even the wind moved. He went to the window and looked out across the yard. Moonlight had broken through the clouds, making distances seem greater. Beyond the silver side of the barn the orchard lay in darkness. He felt like a stray dog, whipped and sent yelping, shaking under the threat of an unforgiving hand. But there were dogs who cowered, and there were dogs who refused to be cowed. Listen to me, he whispered into the night. Whatever you are, I will become like stone and iron against you. And as long as you grip me, as long as you even glance at me, I will never ever let you rest. He drew on his clothes from the day before, and went quietly down the front stairs, determined to go out to the orchard now while anger gave him an edge, and confront whatever waited there. The air was cool, almost chilly, and his clothes felt foreign. He stood on the broad front porch, still holding onto the screen door. For a minute or two he considered going through with it, but in the end he stepped back inside, locked the door, and went up to his room to sleep. Looking after him. Merritt Nelm sat by the window, listening to the rush of the tumbling water, the steady creak of the mill wheel. On the table before him lay packets of dried herbs, each with a handwritten label bearing the name of the plant in Latin, with the common English name beneath it. Callie and Susanna were sifting cornmeal into sacks, bearing printed labels which Doc had designed a water wheel encircled by the words Nelm's Mill, Assembly Cooperative. Tonight, however, Doc was not packaging herbs or meal for the co-op. He unclasped the latch of a leather case and returned four small bottles to their proper places in the velvet-lined interior. I'm still astonished she was successful, Callie said, shaking her head. She helped Susanna seal one of the bags and fitted it snugly into the last bit of space in a large wooden crate. Doc nodded. Nothing certain, of course, but I do have hope. 
Also, I've learned never to underestimate Betsy. She's a remarkable person. We're still worried that it may be only a temporary reprieve, but his pulse and respiration were entirely normal the last time I checked. Some dizziness and headaches, but that would have been expected even under normal circumstances. Has Mark talked with him about what happened? she asked. I don't think so. He's being cautious. There'll be time for that, later on, after they both get settled in. I've told him to keep an eye out for signs of disorientation, unusual shifts in perception, any kind of serious displacement. He tapped the lid of the box. Wouldn't want Fletch slipping off to Saul's ward without a passport. Callie stared at him. He couldn't really do that, surely. Doc shook his head. No, no, not literally, but the sensory experiences can be quite vivid. You know what a single drop in an open room is like. Just imagine four of them, overlapping in your bloodstream, dancing around inside your cells. Yuck, said Susanna, sticking out her tongue. What's yuck, sweetheart? Bloodstreams, she said. He laughed. It's what keeps you alive, honey. It's what's keeping Fletch alive. I like Fletch, Susanna told him, but he doesn't talk. Doc understood what she meant. He's like his mother that way. She'd go for days and never speak. But when she did, it was like rainfall in summertime. She died, Susanna said softly. Fletch isn't going to die, is he? Doc shook his head. Not if I can help it. Besides, he has all of us looking after him, he reassured her. Hidden Histories Mark Forrester turned uncomfortably in bed, unable to slip past the edge of wakefulness. Josh should never have logged along the edge of the swamp. It wasn't as if he were some outlander who didn't know any better. But he'd been drawn by the huge trees growing in the rich bottomland along Vagabond Creek. Josh was lucky to have escaped with his life. It had always been that way in the area around Assembly. The place could be treacherous. Mark had read the official history many times, the quaint story of how white settlers from Effingham County had bought land from the Creek shaman Umasaga for fourteen pounds of beads. But Mark knew things the accepted tales neglected to mention, that the beads had been carved from the bones of children, and that Umasaga had cast them into Narodok, a pit of boiling mud, to appease the appetite of the horror which he believed made its home there and Fletch had been to the labyrinth. In all those miles of forest, of all the places he might have stumbled upon, that was where he'd ended up. It was too unlikely for Mark to dismiss it as chance, and besides, long ago he had learned that very little in assembly happened purely by accident. Was it his imagination, or had their moving here set something in motion? The town had a way of waiting, sleeping almost, keeping its hidden histories secret and letting the years pass with no substantial change, and then acting with amazing swiftness. Then there was the journal entry. Mark hadn't meant to snoop. The notebook was lying open on the stair landing, where Fletch must have dropped it, and Mark had picked it up. Two words had caught his eye and he read the entry before returning the journal to Fletch's desk. Coma dream? Remembered in dream last night, a dream inside a dream. The sound of a bell ringing. Not a pinging hospital bell, an old church bell clanging, but musical and distant. Comforting. Now I almost recall other dreams in the hospital. What were they? A bird singing by a stream? Was there an outdoor choir? Pictures come to me of tumbled stone houses, 
all empty and in ruins, overgrown, some back against cliffs. Are there caves beyond? Fletch had never mentioned these dreams to him, but Mark knew their source. He had experienced them along with Fletch, though he had not been sleeping. He remembered the colorless hospital room, the thin form of his son, alive and breathing but unresponsive, the bleak view over the parking lot, and suddenly a shaft of sunlight coming through the dirt-streaked window, not the gray light of a rainy morning in Atlanta, but golden living light which had moved across a crumbling wall in Italy more than thirty years before. The voice of the bell, sonorous, yet somehow defiant, flinging his brazen, irrational hope into the air. Already Fletch had found some of the Simmons photographs in the yellow room. There was little harm in that, so Mark hadn't disturbed them, but he'd taken the precaution of removing some of the older ones, the set from 1910, for instance. He didn't want his son coming on those by accident. Some kind of context would need to be established for understanding them, and even then they would be horrifying. That would take time. He would have to be careful. He would also have to keep a watchful eye on Fletch. <laughs>